Hello. This video covers some of the basics of the material that we were going to discuss on the 13th of February during class. However, that class was canceled on account of inclement weather, and thus I've decided to introduce some of the basics of what we were going to do that day in this video. This is not everything we were going to do on the 13th of February, but it is some of the basic material that I think you can learn on your own. You are responsible for this material, and there are some homework questions associated with it. In this video, we are going to continue our discussion of the basics of geometric optics, finishing the basics of the idea of refraction that we began last time, and begin some of the basics of the idea of reflection. So last class, we began this problem talking about a light ray coming from water and going into air. And we saw that if the angle with respect to the surface is 41.2 degrees, the outgoing angle is in fact 90 degrees, and the ray just travels along the surface of the water, like this. So now I want to say, okay, what happens if instead this 41.2 degrees is decreased from 41.2 degrees to 40 degrees. So we're going to solve this out. As usual, we're going to use Snell's law, ni sine theta i, nf sine theta f. Now, if this angle is not 41.2 degrees, but 40 degrees, then theta i, which is measured with respect to the normal, remember, thou shalt measure your angles with respect to the normal, then theta i becomes 50 degrees, 90 minus 40. Now let's begin to solve this out. 1.33 is our initial index of refraction, sine of 50 degrees in F, sine theta F, in F is air, so in F is going to be just 1. And so that tells us that sine theta F is going to be 1.33 over 1 sine of 50 degrees, like so. Now, the sine of 50 degrees I've put into my calculator. So that gives me 1.33 sine of 50 degrees is from my calculator 0 0.7660. And when you multiply these two things together, you get a sine theta f of 1.0188 approximately. Now let's look at the hint that I gave before. We have a sine theta f greater than 1. But if you stop and think for a second, sine theta, the maximum sine theta can possibly be is 1. You can't get a sine bigger than 1. So what's going on? What does a sine bigger than 1 mean? Well, a sign bigger than 1 tells us that Snell's law has broken down. And if, and if Snell's law has broken down, what does that mean? No refraction. The light does not penetrate into the air. But that energy's got to go somewhere. It can't just disappear. Conservation of energy. The only possible option is that the light must be reflected. All of the light, it turns out, in this situation, will in fact be reflected at the surface, and none of it will go into the air. This is a process known as total internal reflection. And how do I know that this has occurred? 
How do I know the angle, the so-called critical angle at which this occurs? I look for the angle where sine begins to go greater than one. So the angle at which total internal reflection begins to occur is called the critical angle and that is the last angle with refraction. In other words, the angle such that theta f is 90 degrees. That will be the last angle. If theta i is bigger than this critical angle, no refraction because sine theta f will be bigger than 1 as we have just seen here. And therefore only total internal reflection. So we have a video demonstrating this process. So here we're setting a piece of glass on a nicely marked piece of paper so that you can see what's going on. And then we have a nice collimated source of light. When we shine the light on the laser directly, we can see already the refraction occurring at the interface as the angle is increased. So these angles are measuring our incident angles. More bend, more bend, more bend as the angle increases. Eventually we're getting now close to our critical angle because we see the refracted ray is 90 degrees and beyond that all we have is total internal reflection. So for this material the critical angle is somewhere around 40 degrees. And you can see that if the angle of incidence is increased past 40 degrees, we still just have more and more total internal reflection. This process of total internal reflection has a lot of practical uses in the modern world. A classic example is fiber optic cable, which is becoming more and more important in the global communications network. So now let's think about this a little bit in the context of a question. So we've seen that if I have water and I have a laser beam coming from water into air, I can have a process of total internal reflection. Is it possible to have total internal reflection for a light ray in air as it tries to go into the water? Well, if we stop and think about it, we can see that the answer has to, in fact, be no. How do we know? Well, we again begin with Snell's Law. Ni for the case of air as it tries to go into water in I is going to be 1, in F is going to be the water, now if I simplify this expression for sine theta F, I have 1, Now let's look at this expression. The part in red parentheses, this is always going to be less than 1 because 
1.33 is bigger than 1. Similarly, this is always going to be less than 1 because sine theta is always a number less than 1 for any angle of incidence. So the product is always going to be also less than 1. I can't take two fractions and multiply them together and get a number bigger than 1. So we can see that in this case, it's impossible, it's impossible for sine theta f to be bigger than 1. And so total internal is also impossible. Generalizing I can only have total internal reflection is only possible for large n going to small n. And why is this? Because of the reasoning here, where each individual piece by itself is less than 1. So the product is less than 1, which means sine theta f will always be less than 1, and I'll be okay. The big takeaway here is that total internal reflection occurs because of Snell's law breaking down. This is kind of a new skill for us in the context of this 131 and 132. Most of our laws have worked under every single circumstance. They've never given us weird answers. This is the first time that this has happened. Snell's law gives us an answer that doesn't make any sense. Try to put a number, take the arc sign or the inverse sign of a number greater than one in your calculator, you'll get an error or an imaginary angle, depending upon how your calculator is set up. That doesn't make sense. But that's telling us something. The fact that we're getting num an error, a number that doesn't make sense, is telling us that the light isn't refracted. This is a really powerful idea, that equations breaking down are telling you something about the physical world in and of themselves. So equations can tell, do more than describe phenomena. Their limitations can give you a clue into what's going to happen as well. This is a really big idea as we will go forward in this course. So this concludes refraction. Now we're going to begin with the basics of reflection. The law of reflection looks really simple. Theta i equals theta f. The incident angle equals the final angle. Now, reflection makes the most sense in terms of the particle picture of light. It's easiest to see if we just imagine light as a ball, photon as a ball. As a ball flies, you can see that the incident angle and the final angle are the same as the ball bounces. Here's another video of a single pulse of light traveling and bouncing off of a mirror. And you can see that relative to the normal, which is how you should always measure your angles, the incident angle and the final angle are the same. So now let's begin to try and apply these ideas of reflection and refraction to understand everyday phenomena. Throughout this unit, we're going to use two main tools. One of them are ray diagrams. Ray diagrams are a basic technique that's been around for a long time, where the idea is to trace the path of a few well-chosen photons. These are your so-called light rays. Also along the way, we're going to do a lot of geometry. 
So basic things, looking at congruent triangles, all sorts of stuff like that. Now, if you're a little rough on geometry, I've posted a link on Moodle to Euclid the Game. This is a web game that I personally find very, very addictive that really forces you to think about how geometry works. So it's a really good exercise of if you're a little rusty with geometry. And I'm a big dork, so I think it's kind of fun. So the first application we're going to do is also probably the simplest. It's just a person, in this case Mr. Optic, standing in front of a mirror. Okay? And we're curious about the reflection of his foot in the mirror. So this is the simplest example that will illustrate some of our basic ideas. So we're interested in a light ray that comes from his foot and goes into his eye. So let's draw that light ray that goes from his foot to his eye. Well, we need the law of reflection to hold. We need the incident angle to equal the final angle from the foot, which means that this ray has to meet midway between. So if this is his height, the ray has to meet at half the height. And this is a purely geometry thing. So if I draw a normal at half the height, this is where having rulers and protractors will start to come in handy. At like half the height. And then I draw the light ray from the foot to the mirror, bouncing off the mirror, and into his eye, we can see that, if I were to draw it really correctly, theta i and theta f are the same. So that's the light ray we're looking at. Now, our brains aren't very smart. Our brains assume that light travels in straight lines, which most of the time is pretty good, except for when you start to have mirrors and lenses in the way. And so we can go, and what does our brain assume? Our brain assumes that this ray that came from the mirror actually came from a point behind the mirror, because our brain assumes that light travels in a straight line. So our brain is assuming that this light ray came from a point back behind the mirror. Okay, now we do a little bit of geometry. Now we do a little bit of geometry. So if this angle here is theta i, then this also is theta i because the normal here and the ground are parallel lines. Parallel lines intersected by a transversal have alternate interior angles that are equal. If I extend my line over here, my normal, if I extend my normal back behind the mirror, now I can say that this angle is the same as this angle now I can say that this angle is the same as this angle because vertical angles are equal so if I have two lines that go like this, this angle and this angle are always going to be equal. So that's going to be theta f. And now, again, my normal and my ground are parallel. So if this is theta f, this is theta f. And we know that 
theta i equals theta f, so we might as well just call them all theta. So get rid of all the little subscripts here. Might as well just call them all theta because they're all the same anyway. And now we know this is h over 2 because it had to be in order for this angle and this angle to be the same. So now that we know that this is the same and these are the same, we can conclude that this triangle and this triangle are the same. They're congruent triangles, which means that this distance, however far Mr. Optic is in front of the mirror, is going to be the same as this distance. Now it doesn't look like it because it's really hard to draw on these tablets, but the geometry holds up. So whatever this distance is, this distance is as well. So like I said, we're going to use a lot of geometry here. Now I've done it with actual, uh, you know, on the computer. And when I do it on the computer, then you can start to see that, okay, this triangle and this triangle here are congruent. And so the distance Mr. Optic's foot is in front of the mirror is the same distance that his reflection behind the mirror appears to be. So our brain sees a reflection of Mr. Optic's foot behind the mirror at the same distance that his foot is in front of the mirror. And we could repeat the whole process for a point on Mr. Optic's head, where we have a light ray that comes in, bounces off the mirror with theta i equals theta f into the eye, and the eye interpolates backwards to a point on Mr. Optic's head behind the mirror. So our brain takes these reflected rays, assumes that light travels in a straight line, and uses them to construct an image of Mr. Optic behind the mirror. This should match your everyday experience. Go have a look in a mirror. And if you think about it, you'll see that your reflection appears to be the same distance behind the mirror as you are in front of it, at least if your mirror is flat. If you start having a curved makeup or shaving mirror, things will be different and we'll come to those. But for a flat mirror, your reflection will seem to be the same distance behind as you are in front. This concludes what I think is fair game to be covered in a video for the 13th of February's lesson.